The Shadowrun Returns trilogy plunges you into a dystopian, hyper-technologized cyberpunk near future, in which magic has unexpectedly appeared a few generations ago, bringing with it a drastic change in the status quo of the world. The games will have you take on the role of one of many underworld mercenaries known as Shadowrunners to navigate the gritty post-magically awakened urban landscape, face various challenges and make morally ambiguous decisions while obviously uncovering all manner of dark conspiracies that have the potential of reshaping this cyber fantasy universe. At its core, the Shadowrun Returns trilogy is a semi-loose collection of turn-based tactical computer role-playing video games connected only through the setting. The titles that make up the trilogy are Shadowrun Returns, Shadowrun Dragonfall and Shadowrun Hong Kong and I'll be diving deep into each of them in turn during this video, but we need to start with a bit of background info. The Shadowrun Returns games are based on one of the most popular tabletop RPGs since Dungeons and Dragons that isn't actually related to D&D by neither theme nor system, that game being called Shadowrun. The video game series started back in 2013 with its first title, Shadowrun Returns, and was developed by Hairbrain Schemes, an indie game development company whose founder already has some Shadowrun pedigree. The game was built in Unity and proved to be something of a pioneer in terms of making computer RPGs in Unity. Keep in mind, this was released in 2013, a full two years before Pillars of Eternity would grace our computer drives. Shadowrun's Earth is one in which very suddenly and unexpectedly magic appeared into a world much like our own, the event being called The Awakening. After this event, the world and its people changed. Mythical creatures such as dragons appeared, meta-human races like orcs, trolls and elves morphed from within humanity and the spirit realm became a very palpable and dangerous place. As such, the player will find themselves in an alternate near-future world in which they can replace parts of their body with various cybernetic implants, they can connect their brain straight into the matrix, no, not that one, this one, can control drones remotely, which to be honest isn't that futuristic of an idea nowadays, or they can discover dormant magic talents or perhaps maybe some shamanistic affinities. The campaign that ships with the first game, although linear, is a bona fide murder mystery where the player has to track down a Jack the Ripper style serial killer. The world of Shadowrun Returns is populated with interesting and very colorful characters, even though they are pretty much archetypes or stereotypes, very much in line with the pulpy vibe of the story. There are also several secondary subplots tangential to the main storyline and at the very least the illusion of choice. The story itself starts with your character getting a message from a friend which promptly sends you into a flashback of a quick fight meant to do triple duty. On one level it's meant to work both as something of a tutorial on how combat works, on the second it's meant to place the story's building blocks such as your character's relationship with this friend while at the same time it's a way of telling players unfamiliar with running the shadows that this will definitely be a heavily combat focused game. Turn based and rather tactical combat my absolute favorite. That doesn't mean however the writing is subpar, nothing of the sort, just that it's a bit of what you should expect from the cyber pulpy setup. The descriptions of the locations are wonderfully atmospheric and do a great job at setting up each area. They're neither too detailed nor are they too short, they're just enough to prime the reader for what they're about to encounter, see and hear. They also do a great job at explaining what's been going on in the world around you, while you've been busy running ops or diving into the matrix. When it comes to the dialogue, the game reminded me a lot of the first two Fallout games. The characters are written in a very realistic and in-world way. Talking to them, you'll encounter the world's jargon as well as explanations relating to it. And trust me, there is a lot of it and it's rather fascinating. Keep in mind the video game series is built upon a tabletop RPG first published in 1989, whose latest version, as of this recording, the 6th edition was published in 2019 there is a lot of lore to mine for atmosphere. This only adds to Shadowrun Return's sense of immersion. And again, similarly to the first Fallout games, the characters aren't devoid of a sense of humor either, thus making their characterization and by extension that of their world that much more relatable. 
Although it's absolutely fascinating to be capable of combining magic with firearms or use drones for that matter, the pure turn-based combat system offers an advantage to those characters using ranged abilities and especially guns. In the event in which a character invests all of their karma points into quickness and one or two kinds of guns, they're pretty much set. In the time it takes a melee enemy to get within striking range, I've already reduced their HP by 3 quarters with bullets and that tends to make combat overall a bit unbalanced. Karma points are basically your generic stat points which you can invest into any of the available stats and relevant skills. Apropos of bullets though, something of an oversight that struck me at a certain point during my playthrough, I noticed the ammo for your various guns doesn't exist as a separate resource. Also, it's infinite and ethereal. You know how in many or most RPGs that feature guns, ensuring that you have enough ammo is a thing that varies in importance from they're easily available at any shop to holy shit they're rarer than hen's teeth and it's better to learn how to make your own? Well, not in Shadowrun Returns. Here you have all the ammo in the world, it doesn't occupy any inventory space and you're somehow reloading your weapons with appropriate ammo for each. And I'm not talking about someone having a bag of holding or something, it's just a big oversight in terms of design from the perspective of immersion, at least as far as I'm concerned. The classes are very differentiated and they run the gamut from your more traditional melee or range fighter type classes, with the street samurai sounding as cool as the class is, to various types of magic users and finishing with Shadowrun specific classes such as deckers and riggers. But the game doesn't make you use any one class in particular. It gives you the freedom to create a character from scratch, being able to invest karma points into any skill or ability, thus spawning a completely unique character. I do suggest though for your first playthrough, if you're not familiar with Shadowrun's game system, to choose an already existing class and learn the mechanics that way. After that, you'll be capable of more knowingly creating a super quick and strong katana wielder, or you can combine technology with magic. Although, cybernetic implants and spells don't mix very well on the same character, but the game offers you the opportunity to do it if you're crazy enough. Thanks to this quite large amount of freedom in terms of character creation, the game's replayability scores rather high in my book, higher than it should because of the linearity of the scenario. However, despite it, since you'll get different experiences whilst playing the game with different characters, not to mention that you can always make different choices throughout the game that can influence further events to some degree, every playthrough experience should be fairly customized. You also get a much better sense of alternate pathways because you will oftentimes see the dialogue options that aren't available to you with your current character, but you also get to see which type of background or level of relevant skill you would need in order to access it with future characters if you wish. The soundtrack does a great job at creating the cyberpunk dystopian atmosphere I mentioned earlier, although it is a bit repetitive when returning to home base. I understand the reason behind it and it might not be as noticeable for some, though on its own it makes for a solid listening experience. But I can't be all positive about the game because after all, I would have liked for the campaign to be a bit more fleshed out and for you to be able to interact with more of the world. Some more aesthetic options wouldn't have been bad either, however, I do consider Shadowrun Returns to be more of a proof of concept a very elaborate demo, if you will, for what would be in store for the future in the Dragonfall and Hong Kong cycles. While Shadowrun Returns sets the story in Seattle, which is very appropriate since this tends to be the default setting for the tabletop game, Shadowrun Dragonfall moves things across the pond and sets them right smack in the middle of the old continent, in the Shadowrun version of Germany in Berlin. But just like everything else in the world since the Awakening, Europe and Berlin have changed. While talking to the various companions and NPCs in the game, you can start putting together different parts of the local post-awakening history. At a certain point, there were some Euro Wars, and one can assume that as an aftermath of these events, the once cohesive European countries shattered into numerous city-states. Berlin is one such city-state, but with a twist. As opposed to most others in the world, which are controlled and ran by mega corporations, Berlin exists in a state of stable anarchy, where pretty much everything goes since it doesn't have any sort of government or corporation to impose and enforce laws. Influence and power within the city tend to be exchanged between the various gangs and other organizations that make Berlin their home, creating a sort of precarious balance based on this flow. The one thing that most of these powers have in common is that they all prefer the current situation and would like to see it perpetuated. As such, most will band together to fight off mega corporations trying to muscle in from the outside. Because of this ebb and flow of non-authority, Berlin is known as the Flux State, 
because things are constantly in flux. And just from this very short description of the setting, you should be able to tell that Shadowrun Dragonfall has a completely different type of narrative experience in store for the player. Gone is the pulpy and noirish vibe of Shadowrun Returns low stakes serial killer mystery. Dragonfall sets up a much more mature, complex and interesting staging ground in which the player can have a much greater and fulfilling role. Despite this much grander scope of Dragonfall's story, it starts you in a similar spot, your character doing a run with an old friend. Suffice to say, in proper Shadowrun style, the run goes sideways fast and you're off on what begins as a revenge tale, but as time goes by and you start gathering intel, it becomes something much bigger and insanely more dangerous than your average revenge story. The flux state depends on certain and several powerful individuals and organizations in the community to keep it going, but not everything is as open as one might expect in the flux state, with at least one faction dedicated to fighting for freedom and liberty of information, but there are also some very powerful entities out there biding their time to make Berlin just another corporate-run city-state. Due to the way in which the story is set up, the player will steadily become one such powerful individual. Combat wasn't changed from Shadowrun Returns, at its core it is still turn-based and awesome. It was however improved with some changes to the combat user interface and adding some more abilities and features, like a different armor system as well as the potential of flanking, thus making positioning during your combat turns extra important. The interface change is one of the things that the original game did most, now you're able to see all of your available weapons at once, no more need to scroll through them. It's a small thing, sure, but it makes planning your turns that much easier, since sometimes you might be so focused on what you do next that you'll forget a particular character has another set of attacks perfect for a situation or other. Seeing more usually is best when it comes to RPGs. No real reason to talk about the classes, these are consistent throughout the series and you can get the best information about them from the handy dandy help information available in the game, so make sure to check those out to know where you should be focusing your karma points. I will be centering my attention on talking about the companions you have in Dragonfall, because this time around you actually have your own team of Shadowrunners who won't cost you any money to take with you, and these are some of the most compelling companions that you'll find not only in the entire Shadowrun series, but in most RPGs. Not only are they all very distinct personalities and bring a varied and diverse array of skills to the team, at least two of them have extremely interesting backstories and one of them has quite possibly the most believably realistic tragic backstory that I've found in games. I need to make myself clear and make sure to stress this next point. If you don't spend time talking to your companions after each run, you will be missing a large chunk of what makes Shadowrun Dragonfall's companions some of the most compelling fictional characters that you'll ever have the pleasure of reading about. The combat and main story are all fine and dandy, but the strength of Dragonfall is in its companions' backstories. So not taking the time to talk to them will ensure that you'll be missing the real heart of Dragonfall. One other important thing related to you having companions in Dragonfall is that you also have a say in how they advance through their levels. Mind you, your control isn't as detailed as with your character, but you can choose which abilities your companions focus on as they gain experience alongside you. This is a great touch since it allows you to further customize your team's capabilities. For instance, making Iger into an insanely powerful long-range sniper or a more close-quarters focused runner. Depending on your party makeup, you will be locked out of certain avenues during missions. But that's a positive because it increases the game's replay value. Also, keep in mind there are quite a few optional side runs which you can choose to take or not, some of them depending on how much you interact with your companions. These latter ones are by far the most interesting from a player agency perspective since these are a result of you investing time and interest in your companions' stories and they tend to bring some form of closure to your companions. Dragonfall score adds some more songs to the previous Shadowrun soundtrack, which was a requirement from two points of view. First of all, Shadowrun Dragonfall Director's Cut is a standalone product and as such should have a distinctive soundtrack of its own. Second, the game's different theme and story required the soundtrack to build a different type of mood, a more pensive and ominous one to fit with the heavier subjects discussed in the game. Don't get me wrong though, Shadowrun Dragonfall is not all tragic characters and broody subject matter, the humor from Shadowrun on returns is still very much present because even though we're in a different part of the globe, people and Shadowrunners especially are still the same. However, in Dragonfall, much more so than in the first title, there is one quest in particular that has a heavy dose of comedy. The quest or run I'm talking about is called Lockdown. 
in which you get introduced to one of the most captivating pieces of fiction within fiction since the Silver Shroud radio plays of Fallout 4. I'm talking of course about the series called Night Kings of Lightning Hold, a horribly bad Z-grade fantasy series prominently featured during this quest. It was such fun reading about the show that it actually made me want to either read the thing outright or write episodes of the show. I am a big fan of B-movies from the 80s and this sounded like something that would totally fit within that realm. So to sum things up, Shadowrun Dragonfall Director's Cut is a very well made computer RPG with challenging turn based combat, extremely interesting and compelling characters and a solid soundtrack. Shadowrun Dragonfall Director's Cut is everything that was promised during the first game and more. A big part of the appeal of the Shadowrun game stems from how well they can create a believable world. Granted, a solid story and great gameplay will always be considerably more important, but without a proper setting, the games would just boil down to a few turn-based combat encounters with a bunch of readings stuffed in between them. Placing the story and gameplay within a setting that can not only support them, but actually tie them together is of critical importance. All I can say is that Hairbrain Schemes managed a wonderful job at it with the Shadowrun Returns trilogy because you can almost smell the sea air mixed with garbage and hear some godly colored neon buzzing and flickering in the background of this harbor area of Shadowrun's version of Hong Kong. Everything looks as desolate, dingy and dangerous as it should be, an impression that is only heightened by the very well written text descriptions. I have to mention upfront that in order to get the very most enjoyment out of the game story you'll have to do a serious amount of reading, much more so than during Dragonfall actually. Now I have nothing against it, I would actually love novelizations of both Dragonfall and Hong Kong stories, maybe with each companion getting their own mini books, but some might not have that particular affinity towards the written world so as to enjoy the game on a purely narrative level as well as the turn based combat one. The narrative is a major part of the game since Shadowrun Hong Kong isn't the usual free roaming RPG. In fact, you're quite limited to the amount of locations that you can visit, NPCs that you can interact with and in general the things that you can do. But as far as I'm concerned, I was so invested and focused on the story and on my companions that I didn't really feel the need for the free roaming options of an open world. I just wanted to see what else I'll get to find out about them after each run and how the story would develop further. That said, exploring the maps in detail is very satisfactory since it will result in finding items and NPCs and sometimes even side quest givers. Compared with both its predecessors, the world you have at your disposal in Shadowrun Hong Kong seems a bit larger. If I were to shortly describe the story, I'd have to say it's occasionally intense and always engrossing, each mission or run being its own standalone story with unique characters and intrigue. The way in which you choose to interact with each mission specific characters will dictate to a certain degree how that run plays out. This is just as important as your party's makeup and your choices in approaching the mission to begin with. As far as general tips go, not being an asshole and trying to help people will usually result in the most beneficial of results. The story starts your character off being very, very fucked and requiring the help of the underworld in order to survive and seek out the person who got you into this mess to begin with. It's a solid start, even though a basic and tropish one, but on the other hand, tropes exist for a reason, they work. Once you look at all the games in succession, like I just did over the course of this video, you notice how each one builds upon the accomplishments of the last. While Dragonfall introduced very compelling companions with interesting individual stories, Hong Kong goes further and makes the overarching story the focus and places you at the middle of it in a very interesting manner. As opposed to the first two games where the beginnings of the stories had to do with old friends and then spun into much larger things, Hong Kong's introduction has a lot more to do with family, your character's family to be exact, thus placing the player in a completely different sort of relationship with the events that are taking place, because as the game goes on, the developers manage to make things seem personal and private. They manage this also by splicing in some disturbing dream sequences relevant to the storyline. All the characters in the world seem to be having these sorts of nightmares, but it was a stroke of immersive genius to actually illustrate them for the player as opposed to simply telling you via a text description that you've just had a nightmare and then describe it. Shadowrun Hong Kong brings some very interesting characters that you can take with you on your runs. The great thing is that each of them has a story, but more importantly they have a very personal history that you can choose to look into by talking to them after each run. 
Talking about one's past doesn't gel with the whole idea of being a shadow runner, so they'll require some coaxing. But trust me when I say that once you start talking to them, you'll be doubly interested in finishing a run. On the one hand, there is the money and karma rewards, and on the other, you get to talk some more with your party about what happened in their past, and as a result, find out more about them. They're not exactly as interesting as those in Shadowrun Dragonfall were, but they're pretty close. Keep in mind though that I might be somewhat biased since I found it easier to identify with Dragon Force characters because they're European, whilst the characters from Hong Kong come from a completely different cultural background than mine. But the characters in your party are not the only places where the game's writing excels. The same can be said about the several NPCs that you'll either have to or choose to interact with. In the first camp, there is your fixer, basically your manager and a plethora of characters relevant to each mission in particular. In the second category are all the various merchants and random NPCs that don't really do anything. They're just there to add to the overall story and most importantly to the atmosphere. In saying this, I'm referring to the three all men playing Go, but there are many others of course. Going back to the difference in cultural background portrayed in Shadowrun Hong Kong, as opposed to my own, I added an article after the game's initial release that explained a bit how the simple introduction of the option to address your fixer with auntie, which might seem a bit odd for most westerners, showed in fact good knowledge of Chinese customs, the term for auntie being considered both respectful and informal, considering you're addressing a rather connected underworld actor, and you'll find a lot of such touches throughout the game world. Another quite prominent part of the setting and of the overall story is also a specifically Chinese one, the philosophical system of harmonizing one's environment to one's prosperous existence, or feng shui. While in our world, the concept is pretty much akin to and as real as magic or belief in deities in general, in the awakened world of Shadowrun Hong Kong, feng shui is actual magic and its tenets are very real things that influence going on in the world. Lurking through the BBS forums, on the other hand, has a different sort of atmosphere and immersion, because it offers a quick glimpse at an altered version of the internet. Fuck bitching about movies or starting flame wars about which console is better. Poetry slams are the rebel outlet of the dystopian cyberpunk future. There are also at least two very funny side stories that we can follow through the BBS forums, one of them having to do with a piece of software and the other one quite possibly the unluckiest shadowrunning team ever. The Matrix got seriously revamped, things look largely the same but everything is much more detailed, brighter and considerably more dynamic. The patrolling programs now have a cone of sight, which you can thankfully see, and move on some very crisscrossing and intersecting routes. You need to carefully navigate through the patrols, timing and positioning being key to either not getting detected or to getting detected as late in the hack as possible. They made hacking somewhat challenging and even a bit nerve wracking, it's nothing more complicated than remembering the correct order of a series of increasing number of digits, but the fact that it all takes place on a timer makes the entire thing much more involved. Shadowrun Hong Kong piles on loads of replay value, especially if we compare it to Shadowrun Returns. The main difference being that in Returns case, its replay value was all based on game systems and mechanics, while Hong Kong is worth a replay from a story standpoint as well. There are various places where you can make different decisions, especially when it comes to your party makeup, which in turn will influence your playstyle. As far as the combat system and the classes go, what I said about Shadowrun Dragonfall is pretty much still valid. Although, I must say that Shadowrun Hong Kong seems to be a bit better balanced, either because it increased the amount of HP or of abilities or both. Regardless, when combined with the Matrix overhaul, the combat mechanics in Shadowrun Hong Kong are the best of all the three Shadowrun titles. I like to think of myself as one of those video game analysts who put a particular accent on a game's soundtrack. Music and sound are always an important part of atmosphere, especially when you have such a thematic setting. Shadowrun Hong Kong soundtrack manages to blend the basics of the Shadowrun Return soundtrack with a completely different influence, one that is very Chinese in nature. However, due to this influence, while it makes it work great when supporting the game, it doesn't work as well when you listen to it on its own. I should also mention the extended edition adds on a few more runs after the end of the main storyline and I can say that in general these runs are characterized by rather long combat encounters. A couple of them are optional but I would suggest against skipping them since taking them will give you access to more karma points and money to further upgrade your characters. Granted, only your character can continue growing, your companions will be stuck at their last level of development but you can still give them new weapons and whatnot. There is also a developer's commentary option available in the menu now as well, which you can turn on and listen to while you play. Shadowrun Hong Kong is a great RPG. 
It has an engrossing story, interesting characters and comes with inherent replay value. The gameplay mechanics have been fine-tuned and polished, so much so that I would actually like to replay the Shadowrun Returns and Dragonfall campaigns within Hong Kong's engine. We started with a relatively simple murder mystery in Seattle, we then switched over to Europe where we deal with some interesting philosophical and political subjects, not to mention the most compelling characters in the entire series, to then end in Hong Kong where we're plunged into a more personal type of story with arguably higher stakes than the previous ones. It's a trip around the awakened world that could have been just for show, as long as it stayed true to the basics of Shadowrun cyberpunk dystopia. You know, mega corporations trying to screw each other, magic, cybernetic implants, underworld power struggles and solid turn-based combat. But the world in the Shadowrun games isn't there just to offer a splash of local color. Each game setting is an integral part of their story and characters, and that's one thing that is very difficult to keep consistent, or double and triple down on when making a video game franchise. But this is one major difference when said video game franchise is supported by its dedicated community, through crowdfunding projects instead of the subsequent games being diluted or streamlined, or multiplayer being shoehorned in at the publisher's demand so as to make the games more mainstream palatable. So make sure you support your favorite indie projects going forward, that's where we're getting the most amount of innovation and interesting gameplay and stories. Keep it shattered on Chalmers, Null Sheen. Thanks for watching, if you've reached this point you might want to consider checking out the video on screen or even subscribing. I've been Stefan Ansens, I have a Patreon, have a great rest of your day.